Good evening, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I want to talk to you about a silent tragedy. A silent tragedy that is called maternal mortality. Women, too many women die because of pregnancy, because of wanting to give life. Too many women, and that is about 300,000 per year, die of pregnancy, and they shouldn't die. Also, too many children die. 2.7 million children are born dead, stillbirths. And so many million children don't survive birth, don't survive their first months of life. This is a silent tragedy. That means if you look at, if you try to express in other words, every two minutes somewhere in the world, a woman dies because of giving life. One big airplane a day drops down, and who cares? We even don't talk about it. The burden of this maternal mortality, this maternal death, is of course most in developing countries, Sub-Saharan Africa, as you can see on the map, Southeast Asia. The chance of surviving, of dying, are one in 40, much more than in our countries. Why do women die? How do women die? Well, the top three is they die of bleeding, they die of infections, and they die of hypertension, high blood pressure. All these are uh, causes of mortality that are actually easy to prevent with little interventions, with good health care. So all these maternal deaths, at least most of them, are preventable. On top of that, women die because of abortion, because in many countries, young girls, older women, who are pregnant, unwanted, unplanned, they don't have access to abortion, and they go for illegal, unsafe abortions, which is also a big cause of, uh, of mortality. This is one of my first maternal deaths, and I will never forget it. I've done in my 35 years of working as an obstetrician gynecologist, I've conducted over 15,000 deliveries. Most of them went well, good for the mother, good for the baby. Some of them were tragedies. This is a delivery in uh, Pumani Maternity Hospital, one of the uh, big, big maternity hospitals in Kenya, where we had about 80 to 100 deliveries every day in very poor condition. And this young girl died, she was 14 years old. She was the oldest girl of an AIDS orphan family. Moved to town to look for a job to take care of the younger siblings. She, was, she went to school and she tried to get some money as well. She was abused by a teacher, kicked out of school, and she was living in very poor condition with the other brothers and sisters pregnant, three days in labor, and finally she was brought into the maternity where the baby had already died because the uterus had ruptured and the girl died in my, in, in my hands. We couldn't do anything anymore because she came too late and because we didn't have the facilities to intervene. And unfortunately, she was not the only one. I have seen so many young girls, women, dying of preventable causes and we should not accept. You know, probably all of you know, the Millennium Development Goals. In 2000, the world leaders have agreed on eight Millennium Development Goals to make it a better world, to reduce child mortality, to have better education, better access, to reduce malaria, to reduce HIV AIDS by 2015. We are almost 2015. Are we reaching the goals? Some goals, yes. The one that we are not reaching, there is progress. You can see the green line. There is some progress in maternal death. But the one that we are not reaching is this maternal mortality. And why? Why is it more difficult than the other goals? Because it has to do with women's rights. 
It has to do with women's rights of access to education, access to family planning and contraceptives, access to health care, independent decision taking. What can, many, in many countries, women don't have the power to go to a health facility, they cannot decide, they depend on the father, on the husband, on the, on the society. So saving lives of women globally is very important. Maternal mortality can be reduced, but we have to act faster. And one of the key interventions that I want to address is access to family planning. Why don't we have access to family planning? We should focus more. We have neglected that area here in the West. We have access, we have everything. We have sexual and reproductive rights. Not 100% equality, but still we have gained a lot. We had the first feministic revolution, the second one, the waves. But that is not the part in many parts, of, not, not the situation in many parts of the world. And even in our own settings, we, are, we see some backwards movement. We have to be very vigilant and make sure that our sexual and reproductive rights are maintained. Uh, improving access to family planning is really key. And happily, last year, the world has done some efforts. World leaders, um, uh, together with, with uh, the UN, together with uh, big companies and private sector, have joined forces and have developed an action plan. And the action plan is, as there are at least 220, and probably many, many more, million women who would like to access contraceptives, who would like to avoid a pregnancy, who would like to spread their family planning, don't have access, and we want to give them access and to give them their own decision power. The goal is to reduce the unmet needs by half so that by 2020, 2020, that at least the, the family planning uh, access is improved. And we need $4 billion for that. It's not even that much money. What is needed? Investment, indeed investment is needed, but much more than that. Political will is needed, political leadership. Young girls specifically, they are the adolescents, the growing group of adolescent girls. We have to support them. Because if you look worldwide on how, why do young women die, number one is pregnancy. Unwanted pregnancy, unsafe abortion, young uh, delivery at a young age, that's why women die. Also, women are treated um, unequally, not only by society, but also by nature. Because, this is not the topic of my intervention, but let's, let's look at HIV. HIV is much more, is 10 times higher in young girls of 15 years old, for example, than in young boys. Why is that? Because they are much more susceptible, they, they, are, they are abused, they are treated unequally, they don't have sexual power, so they are more victims. By the way, I know this, this audience is very knowledgeable, all intelligent, very intelligent people, but let, you ask, let me ask you just one question on HIV. What do you think is the probability, the chance, if an HIV-infected man has unprotected sex with an HIV negative women, a non-infected woman, what is according to you the chance that that woman will be infected? Who has a guess? Who says around 20%, 50%? Who says more than 50%? Who says more than 20%? And who says less than 20%? and a lot of people doubt, are in doubt, it's about 1%. And vice versa, the infection probability from um, an infected, an HIV-infected woman to a man, it's even much lower. Don't be reassured, I see a lot of you thinking, if I had known that. <laughs> Only 1%, why do we worry? What, what is all this, this hassle about? Of course, it is a deadly virus, and once you have it, it is maybe now treatable chronic disease, but it is still, why do we have an epidemic? Because, well, people have sex more than once in life. Back to, ah, yeah, yeah. 
back to the family planning and the contraceptives. Contraceptives is a better word, but family planning is politically more acceptable. So why is it so difficult? Access to quality healthcare services is one thing. It's also a question of women's rights, as I said already before. Political goodwill, political leadership. We know it has to be done, but there is a need to, for political leadership. And governments should be made accountable. If in a country women are dying, girls are having illegal abortions and so on, and the country doesn't react, we should make the government, the leaders, uh, accountable. But also cultural and religious factors do play a very important role. And as long as church leaders are more kind of making, uh, acting against uh, sexual and reproductive rights, they are, if that is their, more their concern than about poverty, I think they should focus their efforts rather into fighting poverty than fighting sexual and reproductive rights of women. Then we would have a better world. Family planning is absolutely needed. Why? Because of, as I said already, reducing the number of unplanned and unwanted children, reducing maternal mortality, reducing child mortality, also for the family well-being. When you have children who are really wanted, lower number of children, parents can better take care of them. They have a better future. It will also contribute to participation of women to the labor market and have a positive impact on ecology and environment. We all know we are more than 7 billion already, going to 9, maybe 11 billion. We are thinking on how can we decrease our, the world's ecological footprint, how can we better make uh, use of our resources, lower the, 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 the overuse of the resources, but we also have to include family planning in the equation, not by coercion, not by forcing governments, forcing people to have one child, but by allowing and inviting people, those who want to reduce their number of children. And Karen Singh, who is a very well-known Indian professor and philosopher, he said in 74, development will lead to contraceptives. In 94, he said, contraceptives will lead to development. So we, and we, we have to act on that. And I want to also touch base on one other subject, which is violence, violence against girls and women. We just published this week a report, an impressive report of a study that was done together with a London school heading by, headed by Professor Peter Piot and our group at the World Health Organization a multi-country study looking at violence against gender-based violence in 31 countries of the world. The results are available everywhere, but show that one woman in three has experienced sexual violence in her life, mostly partner violence, and that sexual violence within marriage is widely spread. It is actually mainstreamed and looked at something in, in, in many cultures, something that is normal. First, you beat her, then you love her, is something that we hear too often. It's considered as something that is normal. So we have to fight, we cannot accept this, this form of uh, violence anymore. In addition, other forms of violence, look at female genital mutilation. We should fight that with all methods that we have and not accept it as a kind of a cultural, with cultural relativism. It is really damaging women and we should do whatever we can to stop this, this practice. Over 39 girls every day are married, girl brides, between the age of 10 to 14 years old. This is also a silent tragedy and we hardly talk about it. Women are not only half of the world population, they make the other half and they deserve much more respect. So let's please think about the health and the respect and the dignity of women. And we have to reclaim feminism as a social political movement towards human rights. Feminism 
It's not about women. It's men and women who fight for equal rights and who stand up against the reality in many parts of the world, also increasingly in our societies, that are making women inferior citizens. So let's embrace this statement and let's fight for the social political movement toward, towards human rights.